Hi guys, so with anatomy and physiology, we're going to look at principles that will build into bigger things as we go forward, but I don't want anybody running home studying this to death. This is not going to be a major focus of your national exam. So I'm going to speed through this, and at any moment in time, uh, Tammy will stop and replay any one of these slides. Uh, but I'm going to move pretty quickly. We definitely want to get you all in and out of here in the next hour and a half. All right. And if you have any questions, thoughts, please never hesitate to call me, email me. I will be working. I am going to be out on business. So therefore, I'll be checking up uh, pretty much after five o'clock every day. Thanks. Hopefully this introduction seems familiar to you because we've actually talked about this before in class as far as arteries are the vessels that bring blood or take blood away from the heart full of oxygen and they flow into smaller vessels and then even very smaller vessels and the smaller vessels are arterioles. The very smallest vessel is capillaries and essentially through the capillaries it flows into a little bit bigger venules and then into veins and we know veins are returning to the heart and they're generally deoxygenated. Inside of our circulatory system we have two primary uh, avenues or ways that the blood circulates and essentially we have pulmonary circulation which is the entire right side of the heart and this is all geared to getting blood back to the lungs to be reoxygenated and then we have what's called systemic circulation and that pushes blood to the entire body. Now systemic is a word you're going to hear again so remember systemic means to the entire body, pulmonary to the lungs. I really like this diagram because it shows just the way that the blood circulates. So you can see right there on what would be your left hand side when you're facing at the board but it's really anatomical position the right hand side of your body is going to be your pulmonary circulation and that's your veins and your whole right side of your heart and then once it goes to your lungs it goes into an exchange process exchanges oxygen for carbon dioxide and then it pumps back to your heart and that's where systemic circulation begins and that pumps to the whole rest of your body it goes back through another capillary network and that's where we hand off the oxygen carbon dioxide I'm sure that this is just a reminder of your high school anatomy and physiology but the heart is broken into four chambers we have the upper chambers which is our atria or atriums and then we have our lower which is our ventricles now here's what I want you to think about with this atriums are receiving chambers they receive blood ventricles are pumping chambers they pump blood now we're going to look at how blood flows through the heart remember we always read right to left and so does the blood the blood always flows from right to left it's going to start from our largest vein which is the vena cava now the vena cava attaches to the right atrium in two places either um, on the top or the bottom and back to using terminology superior means above inferior means below so all it means is everything from the head and neck region drains down through the superior into the right atrium and everything from the rest of your body comes back up through the inferior vena cava into your right atrium now starting from your vena cava you'll see follow the blue arrows on the right hand side now really fast side note your blood is actually blue until it hits oxygen that's why our veins appear that bluish purple color now please don't go home and try and cut to see the blue blood it will never happen because the moment blood hits oxygen it becomes red but here we're going to go through the flow so through our superior and inferior vena cava into our right atrium through a valve which we call a tricuspid we always try before we buy the other valve on the opposite side is going to be the buspid but down from the right atrium through the tricuspid into our right ventricle from the right ventricle we're going to go through another chamber and another way to think of this is anytime we leave a chamber we're going to pass through a valve and so we go through the what's called pulmonary semilunar valve out 
through the pulmonary arteries and into the lungs. Now right here we need to make a special note because the pulmonary arteries are the only place inside of the body where an artery is going to carry deoxygenated blood. Generally arteries carry oxygenated blood. Goes through the lungs, becomes oxygenated, and is going to flow through the left pulmonary vein into the left ventricle. Now, this is another note. This is the only vein in the entire body that's going to carry oxygenated blood. Generally, veins are returning the oxygenated blood to your heart. Now, from your left atrium, we're going to flow down now through the bicuspid into the left ventricle and then out through what we call the aortic semilunar valve and out through the aorta. Your aorta is the largest artery in your body and that carries through systemic circulation, arteries into arterioles, into capillaries, into venules, into veins, back through our vena cava into the right atrium, left vent or excuse me, right ventricle out to your lungs, back to the left atrium down into your left ventricle, out through your aorta, through arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, to start the process all over again. The heart is roughly the size of your fist, and contrary to popular belief, one third of it sits on the right side of your heart, or of your chest, and two thirds to the left side. Your heart is made up of several layers, but the main layer I want you to key into here is called the myocardium. The myo is the middle thick layer, and that's what is responsible for contraction and moving the blood through your heart. Once again, atriums receive the blood, ventricles pump the blood. As we were discussing before, there's a valve that leaves every single chamber, so when the blood enters into the right atrium, it must pass through a valve to get to the right ventricle, and same with the left atrium to the left ventricle, and we call these atrial ventricular valves because they connect the atriums to the ventricles. Very straightforward. And so essentially we call the one on the right side the tricuspid because we want to try things before we buy them. And then on the left side is what we call the bicuspid or referred to as the mitral valve. Like we were talking about before, the vena cava, whether it's superior or inferior, drops into the right atrium. And essentially we have atrial contraction which pushes through the tricuspid and into the ventricle and particularly the right ventricle here and it's going to shut before the right ventricle contracts therefore not pushing blood in a backwards motion. Now a couple interesting fun facts here is we do have these strong fibers that actually anchor these valves in so that they can shut and you know, have this back force pressure from the ventricles and this is what we jokingly say pulling on our heartstrings because this is what attaches to them. Now another kind of fun fact, when you hear the lub dub in your heart, it's not really the contraction relaxation phase like a lot of people think. It's actually the opening and shutting of these valves. Ventricles are pumps. Continuing on with the blood flow, the right ventricle contracts and it pushes through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary arteries and supplies the lungs with blood where the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange takes place. Okay, Tammy, stand in front of the PowerPoint and have somebody who thinks they've got this down go ahead and walk us all through the blood flow through the heart. Or if you want, you can be nice and lead the class one more time through the diagram, showing them on the board. Thanks. Now, from the pulmonary or from the lungs, it moves through the pulmonary veins, the blood that is. Now it's oxygenated, it goes into our left atrium, down through our bicuspid or mitral valve, and into our left ventricle. From the left ventricle, we're going to pass through the semilunar aortic valve and into the aorta. Here has all the valves once again and where they're located. I'm hoping you all are starting to get the gist here, so we're just going to
kind of slide on through the next couple of these. Here it is introducing the last circulation and that is what we call coronary circulation and that is when the blood literally supplies the myocardium with oxygen so that it can continue to work at its high pace and pump blood. So once again now we have pulmonary circulation that does what? Supplies blood to where? The lungs. Then we have systemic circulation that supplies blood to where? The body. And now we have coronary circulation which supplies blood to Yes, the heart, the myocardium. When one of these coronary arteries, and now we're talking about coronary, meaning arteries that supply the blood to the myocardium, becomes occluded, that causes a heart attack. Now, from now on in the medical field, we are not going to call heart attacks heart attacks. We are going to call them myocardium infarctions. Okay? myocardium infarctions. I want everybody to say it with me three times. Myocardium infarction. Myocardium infarction. Myocardium infarction. Good. And sometimes we shorten that to MIs. Now just how arteries supply blood to things, right? They essentially leave the heart and bring blood. Then they go through the process of gas exchange through the capillaries and now veins bring blood back to start all over again. So coronary veins do the same exact thing. Something I find absolutely fascinating is that the heart doesn't just work on sheer mechanics. It has an electronic system that conducts and basically governs its mechanical state. Here we see the conduction system for the first time. Up in the right atrium, you're going to see the sinoatrial node, or abbreviated SA node. Then that's going to flow through internodal pathways to the atrioventricular node, or AV node. From here, it's going to go through what we call the bundle of His. The bundle of His is going to break into right and left bundle branches and then it's going to flow into the Purgingi fibers. And the Purgingi fibers are those little fibers that go into the myocardium, well, specifically the ventricles, and cause the ventricular contraction. The SA node is charged with pacing the heart, and it should keep a pace between 60 and 100 beats per minute. The SA node fires into the AV node, and as it does that, it spreads across the atriums like a wildfire, and every single time that that electricity touches a cell, it just contracts completely. And so once it hits the AV node, the AV node slows that impulse down so that we can get full atrial contraction and kick, pushing all that blood into our ventricles. Sorry, jumped the gun like usual on this one, just talked before. I should have, but uh, essentially the AV node slows the impulse so that we can get full atrial contraction. Now we finish everything off, flowing through the bundle of his and down into the right and left bundle branches and into our Purgingi fibers, completing our ventricular contraction. So now we've had atrial contraction, ventricular contraction, and the system just opens back up and it starts to refill with blood. An ECG is a machine we use to record the electrical activity through the heart and essentially we see patterns and different things that tell us pathology and what is wrong with somebody's heart. Couple things here. Depolarization is another word for contraction. So P wave represents atrial contraction. The QRS complex represents ventricular contraction. T wave is responsible or shows that the heart's refilling, relaxing with blood. And honestly, this is all pretty far outside of the phlebotomy realm. You don't really need to know about this. This is going pretty deep here, but essentially what this is saying is that we have different hormones and different electricity that's going to be released in different times. So a lot of the times this is referred to the flight or fight syndrome, um, parasympathetic and sympathetic. 
Yeah, if this interests you, please take the time to read this, but this is way far beyond what y'all need to know. This is definitely getting into EKG. So my two ladies up front, I want you paying attention. Go back, read this. This is good stuff. Two terms here that I want you to be familiar with, hyper and hypo. Now most people have been exposed to like a hyper child or something like that, so we know that's a speed up. Hypo means low. So when we have hyperkalemia, that's an increase in potassium, and hypokalemia is a decrease in potassium. Just like hyperglycemia is an increase in blood sugar, and hypoglycemia is a decrease. And yeah, I know the screen says hypercalcemia for calcium, but you're going to hear hypoglycemia a lot more as a phlebotomist. We measure the contraction and relaxation of the heart. We call that systole and diastole. And essentially, this is the two numbers that we get when we take a blood pressure. So the top number is considered to be contraction, and that's why it's always a higher number, historically 120. And the bottom number is the diastole, which is historically 80, or what they say textbook is 120 over 80. Now, the cardiac cycle is a very fancy way of saying one complete heartbeat. Oh, here it's sharing that secret that our love dub is really just valves opening and closing. Also way deeper than we're ever going to go, but essentially um, these are pieces of the fibers that stimulate the heart to uh, do what it does. Essentially the cause of most murmurs are when the valves don't close all the way and it does allow for backflow of blood. Okay, we talked about this one. Back to the point, aorta is our largest artery, the vena cava is our largest vein. Okay, I hope you guys got this now. Arteries flow away into smaller arterioles, into capillaries, exchange happens into venules and into veins. If you remember my wonderful drawing of vessels going into the X's where I did capillaries for exchange, um, this is just a way better picture. This is what I need you to take from this. Arteries have thicker, bigger walls because it has to take the pressure of the beating heart. Nice diagram of that thickness and why it needs to be there to take the pumping of the heart. Okay, a couple things here. Vasoconstriction is when a vessel constricts together and vasodilation is when a vessel opens to allow things through. But we're going to see vasoconstriction again when we talk about the coagulation cascade, which we already started the other day, if you guys remember, and that's when we introduced anticoagulants. Okay, I really want you to remember capillaries are where the exchange happens. It's going to exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide, nutrients for waste. Good stuff, but you don't really need to know it. Great diagram of how capillaries exchange things. What I want you to take from this is that cold hands don't give a lot of blood. So warm your patient's hands up before you give a capillary puncture. Now this is important. Veins do not get the constant pushing pressure of the heart like arteries do. Therefore, they have valves that are put inside of the veins. Couple side things here. Whenever you don't eat well, all your junk builds up in these valves. So once a year, twice a year, it's good to do a cleanse or switch up your diet because it will signal your body to clean these up. If you've ever gone and worked out and afterwards felt like a little intoxicated or maybe even got sick, it's because your body was re-releasing all those toxins that were caught in those valves. But when you are palpating or finding a vein in the hand, which remember the back of the hand we call dorsal veins, when we're looking at the back of the hand, you may notice some of your veins Y together. Well, anytime we go to stick a vein in the hand, we have to draw above or below the vein. If we draw through that Y, then it's going to shut it down because all the valves can talk to each other and when one valve receives a signal it will send the signal to all the other valves and one of the reasons we get vasoconstriction helps for clotting 
But with this why, I know as a phlebotomist, you're like, yes, I'm gonna stick right through that why because that gives me a better odds of hitting, but you, you can't do that. You have to go below the why or above the why. Now, Tammy, if you don't mind, just take a moment, make sure everybody understands what I mean by valves and how to locate them in the back of the hand uh, because it is a, a real bummer when you see blood in your butterfly and you think you got the vein and then bam, no blood comes out. Okay, once again, systolic means contraction and that's why systolic is the top number of the blood pressure. Now the bottom number historically is showing repolarization or relaxing refilling and therefore is the bottom number, the diastolic pressure. Okay, things are measured in units. Here just note that the unit of measurement for blood pressure is millimeters of mercury. This will come into play because we will want you to pump up to 80 to find hidden veins. Um, a little trick on finding veins. Blood pressure is one of the leading components of what we call vital signs. And I do want everybody to be able to do vital signs before you leave class. Not that it's overly demanded of a phlebotomist, I would just hate for you to be in an interview and then ask you if you can do vital signs and you say no and you don't get the job over something so silly. So towards the end of the class we're going to have plenty of extra lab time. You guys will just be whipping through each other, you can only stick so many times. Remind me, I will go over this with you. I have a blood pressure cuff, cuff stethoscope, everything. I'll show you how to do this, okay? Pulse is our next part of our vital sign and what we're going to do is we're going to hold our two fingers across our wrist and preferably the left wrist. Wherever you feel the beating then move your fingers over because what you're doing is you're actually pinning the radial pulse to your radius um, or a radial bone and your or radial artery to the radial bone excuse me and then you're going to count how many times this beats for 30 seconds times by two we always calculate pulse as beats per minute 60 seconds the next two slides are in comparison with EKG so once again two ladies in the front you should already know this but stroke volume is one beat of the left ventricle and how much it pumps out which plays in the cardiac output which is the next cycle so here stroke volume greatly affects cardiac output cardiac output is defined as how much volume is being pumped out over a minute and this is why when somebody has a really hot um, fast heartbeat it can be very traumatic because your your heart's really not pushing out a lot of blood even though it's working really fast and we know the heart supplies itself with its own blood so if it's overworking itself and it's not really pushing a lot of blood not a lot of oxygen and it can quickly compound into a dangerous situation okay what i want you to know from this is that there is a thing called itrogenic anemia I-A-T-R-O-N-G-I-C, itrogenic anemia. And what that means is when we draw too much blood in a short amount of time, we can cause somebody to become anemic. So we have to calculate blood volume, and we will talk about this later um, in a couple chapters to come, but I just wanna plant that seed right now. We do have to calculate total blood volume, to avoid causing itrogenic anemia. Now, really this is gonna become um, more of a concern when we're dealing with infants. Okay, once again, way too deep, don't need to know it. Now, if you're not familiar, viscosity is used in a lot of different ways, but anytime you hear viscosity, it is the thickness. It is how thick something is. So for example, we will do viscosity in urine quite a bit, and that's how much sediment is in the urine, how thick is the urine. Okay, so blood pressures are pretty easy. We're gonna go ahead and take the stethoscope, put it on the median cubital, you all know where that's at now, and you're gonna put the stethoscopes in, you're gonna pump that little ball up to roughly 200, and then you're gonna slowly release it, where you hear the first beat, that's your systolic pressure, and it's gonna beat, 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 and where you hear the last beat, that's your diastolic pressure, and there you go, you got your two numbers. 
Blood pressure can change for a lot of reasons, including posture and stress and anxiety. So that's one of the main reasons as a phlebotomist, we wanna keep people calm and confident and in control so that we can reduce that. And we never want somebody to cross their legs before we draw their blood. We always want them flat footed, sitting upright. Okay, pulmonary circulation supplies blood to where? Yes, lungs. Systemic circulation pro provides blood to what? Yes, the body. Arteries go away from the body. If you were to take every single vessel inside your body and straighten it all out, so it's side by side by side, you have more vessels that it would essentially go around the world twice. Pretty interesting fact. You really don't need to know this for your national exam. Once again, interesting, but not necessary. Also fun and interesting, but we don't need to know it. Aorta is part of what circulatory system? Yes, systemic. Every part of your body needs blood to stay alive. Cerebral means brain. Carotid sinus, which is located where your carotid artery is, artery is, if it's rubbed and massaged, it will lower your blood pressure. Fun, but not necessary. Veins have valves, so be aware when you're doing butterfly dorsal vein draws. When I get back, I'll show you guys how to do a jugular carotid draw. I'll need a volunteer, though. Twice around the earth, it's just amazing. Superficial veins are those really skinny veins on the top of your skin. Um, I know the other day, Crystal, you were looking at some um, of my superficial veins. Not very good to stick, will not give you a lot of blood. We need to palpate for bigger veins. People create superficial veins in a lot of different places. A lot of the times they're referred to as like spider veins and you find them in your legs. Oops, jumped ahead of this slide. Hepato means liver. Your liver filters your blood.